Well, good afternoon, brother. Happy Sabbath to all of you, wherever you may be. I know we are very scattered out, and it's always wonderful to come together, whether it's uh, together uh, personally or together via electronically, it's wonderful to spend the Sabbath together. I'd like to give a special shout out to four special ladies in the church. First one is Nancy Miller. I'd like to say Feliz Sabado a ti. Nancy's learning a little bit of Spanish, and so I'd like to do that with her. Also, a shout out to Kay Barnett, to Jean Ward, and to Daisy Swint. I hope you're all having a wonderful Sabbath, as well as everyone else listening in. Well, brethren, it is a wonderful yet humbling honor that we are understanding the truth of God the Father and of Jesus Christ more and more and more. Seems like we're understanding more things each and every week. I believe that God the Father is actually pouring out His Spirit among His children, and He's allowing us to understand more and more about Him, more about His identity, more about the identity of Jesus Christ, more about His plan of salvation, more about His holy days, more about His kingdom, more about His Spirit, and more about His will. You know, many sermons have been given, many articles have been written and published, and many discussions have been held in many churches over the past decades on whether Jesus Christ was the God of the Old Testament. And that is a, a controversial subject right now in the churches of God. In the grand majority of these communications, two scriptures are consistently mentioned as major proofs that Jesus Christ was indeed the God of the Old Testament. These two verses are Exodus 3 and verse 14 and John 8 and verse 58, which discuss the term or the title, I am. Please turn with me to Exodus 3 and verse 14, where we read about Moses' introduction to God at the burning bush. In Exodus 3 and verse 14, we read, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Please turn with me to John 8 and verse 58, where we will read about Jesus' proclaiming of the fact that he had a it had existed at the time of Abraham. In John 8 and verse 58, we read, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now those who believe that Jesus was the God of the Old Testament use the occurrences of the word, I am, in both verses as a direct link between both verses and as a proof that Jesus was that I am, and therefore was the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. So brethren, in my sermon this afternoon entitled, Who is the I Am? I would like to explore in depth these two verses to discover their meaning, to analyze the grammar of the Hebrew and the Greek texts, and to determine the identity of the I Am. In most of the sermons or publications that I've heard or read by many of the churches of God, th this subject is discussed using the English verses, English words, English definitions, English meanings and syntax, English sentence structure, and English grammar. As a result of the differences between languages and grammar and verb tenses, in word meanings, in sentence structure and in syntax, an explanation of these verses using only English does not represent the basis for establishing doctrine. First of all, the Old Testament was written almost entirely in Hebrew, while the New Testament was written entirely in Greek, although there is some discussion and debate by scholars on whether some of the gospel books were originally written in Hebrew or in Aramaic. First of all, let's discuss Hebrew. In order to explore the meaning of Exodus 3 and verse 14, we need to learn just a little about Hebrew and its grammar. 
Here are two important points in Hebrew grammar that will help us in that understanding. Point number one, there is no simple present tense for the verb to be in Hebrew. There is no simple present tense for the verb to be in Hebrew. Like many other languages such as Russian, Arabic, Ukrainian, Hungarian, Japanese, Hawaiian, and Turkish, the Hebrew language does not have the verb to be in the present tense. In Russian, to say the book is here, one would simply say Kniga's Dies, or book here. The verb to be is understood but not included in the sentence. Please turn with me to Genesis 15. The Hebrew language handles the verb to be in the present tense exactly the same way. In Genesis 15 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1. We read, After these things the word of Jehovah came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. For those of you who have a King James Version or a New King James Version of the Bible, you will notice that the word am in this verse is in italics, indicating that the word does not exist in the original text. Just a few of the over 2,700 examples of this grammatical construct in Hebrew include Genesis 17 and verse 1. Please turn with me there, Genesis 17, and we'll read verse 1. And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, Jehovah appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, or the El Shaddai. Walk before me and be you perfect. You'll notice there that the word am is in italics. In Genesis 28:13. Genesis 28 and verse 13. And behold, Yahweh stood above it and said, I am Jehovah, God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereupon you lie, to you will I give it and to your seed. Again, the word am is in italics. In Genesis 35 and verse 11, we read, Genesis 35 and verse 11. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of you, and kings shall come out of your loins. Again, the word am is in italics because the verb to be doesn't exist in the text. The lack of a verb to be conjugated in the present tense in Hebrew is an, an important and critical concept in the subject of this sermon. Point number two, Hebrew places importance on verb aspect more than verb tense. Hebrew places importance on verb aspect more than verb tense. The English language has three main groups of tenses, present, past, and future. Each of these tenses contains four subtenses, the simple, the progressive, the perfect, and the perfect progressive. English also has four other special use tenses. Therefore, the English language has 16 tenses, 16 tenses which cause students of English much consternation when they're trying to learn and trying to speak English correctly, even after years of study. English is a very tense, centric language. Knowledge of this peculiarity in English is important because other languages such as Hebrew and Greek are not so tense, centric but instead they rely on other ways of denoting actions in time and in manner. Hebrew, like many other languages, like Russian, places high importance on the aspect of the verb, on whether an action has been completed or not. So there are two main aspects in Hebrew verbs. 
the perfective aspect and the imperfective aspect. Now, the perfective aspect is used in Hebrew to show that an action has been performed and has been completed, since, hence the word perfective. The perfective aspect is mainly used as a past tense verb form for actions that have been completed. Please turn with me to Genesis 1 and verse 1, a very, very famous verse. And we will read an example of the perfective aspect in Hebrew. Genesis 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God created the heaven and the earth, and he finished it. So the perfective aspect of the verb create was used in this verse because it has been completed. Now the imperfective aspect is used in Hebrew to show that an action is an ongoing action or is an action that has not yet occurred so it can't be completed. The key is that the action has not been completed so the action cannot be perfective hence it is imperfective. Please turn with me to Jeremiah 30 and verse 22. And we will read an example of the imperfective aspect in Hebrew. And, Je and Jeremiah 30 and verse 22. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 22. We read, And you shall be my people, and I will be your God. The Hebrew word for will be in this verse is aye, E-H-Y-E-H, aye. In this verse, the imperfective aspect denotes future tense. It has not occurred yet. It's future, so it can't be completed. It can't be complete. We'll return to this word aye shortly. Remember the word aye. In Genesis 2 and verse 6, we read another example of the imperfective aspect. But this way, it's in the past. Genesis 2 and verse 6. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Now in this verse, went up is actually in the imperfective aspect because it was referring to a repeated past action. A better rendering of this verse would actually be, but there used to go up a mist from the ground. It happened again and again and again. Therefore, the imperfective aspect can denote future actions or past or present or future actions that are repeated on a continual basis or past or present actions which move forward in a progressive manner without completion. Context in the sentence will dictate what tense should be used in translating and understanding what has been written. Please be aware that this discussion has been a very substantial simplification of a much more complex grammatical discussion on the use of Hebrew aspects, verb tenses, and their meanings when reading the scriptures. Now that we have reviewed some of the very basics of Hebrew grammar, let's turn again back to Exodus 3, and we will read the very well-known story of Moses' introduction to the Almighty God. Moses had fled Egypt 40 years prior, and then the last 40 years, he had been tending sheep so Moses is now 80 years old when he comes into contact with the Almighty God. In Exodus 3, and we'll begin in verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. In verse 2, And the messenger of Jehovah appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. So here's an entity here who is the messenger of Jehovah. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. 
And Moses says, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And in verse 4, and when Jehovah saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. So here we have another entity who is Jehovah. You have the messenger of Jehovah and you have Jehovah. Let's skip down to verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And then the famous verse, verse 14, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. In verse 14, the words, I am that I am, are the Hebrew words, Eye, Asher, Eye. There's the word Eye. The Hebrew word Eye is the first person singular form of the verb to be in the imperfective aspect. This is the exact same word as we read earlier in Jeremiah 30 and verse 22. Again, verbs in the imperfective aspect can denote future actions or past or present actions which are repeated or are on a continual basis or are past and present or present actions which move forward in a progressive manner without completion. It covers a whole host of verb tenses in the English language. An option for translating aye asher aye would be simply to translate the phrase in the future tense in both occurrences. In German, the 1545 Luther Bible translates this phrase as ich werde sein der ich sein werde, meaning I will be who I will be. In the German Bible, it's, it is translated both parts into the future tense. Most translators in English and in other languages have chosen the simple present tense as the wording of the phrase, I am that I am. However, the simple present tense in English does not adequately convey the progressive and imperfective nature of the verb in Hebrew. Aye denotes more than a static state of being. It conveys a dynamic state of being that transcends the past, the present, and the future. In the Russian synodal version of the Bible, I am that I am is translated as Yayest Sushchi, which means I am existing, and I am is translated as Sushchi, which means the existing one. Russian has the same problem that Hebrew does because they do not use the verb to be in the present tense. This translation transcends the present time and bridges the past and the future. This translation is similar to the Greek Septuagint translation, which we will discuss momentarily. I personally believe that, the op that an option for translating Aye Asher Aye that conveys this dynamic state of being across time would be, I have been who I will be. Which would convey a past continual state of being in the past up to the present as well as a future continual state of being. It is important and critical to note that Aye Asher Aye was not the name of the God being who was talking to Moses. It was not his name. Let's read further in Exodus 3. It's, a, it's incredible that everyone stops at the end of verse 14. But let's read further. We'll begin in verse 14 in Exodus 3. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, You shall say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Now let's read 15. No one ever reads verse 15. And verse 15 is a key. 
And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, Jehovah, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. Jehovah was his name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, Jehovah, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. The importance of verse 15 is that Jehovah reveals to Moses that his name was Jehovah. Eye or Eye Asher Eye was not his name. Please turn with me to Exodus 6 and verse 3, where we will read an additional proof of this. This God being revealed something very special about himself to Moses that he had not revealed before to anyone else, apparently. In Exodus 6, we'll begin in verse 2. Exodus chapter 6 and verse 2. And God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am Jehovah. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, Jehovah was I not known to them. So verse 3 again says, I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by God Almighty, El Shaddai. Abraham knew God the Father and knew uh, Jehovah as El Shaddai, not as Jehovah. But by my name, Jehovah, I was not known to them. So I, Abraham and the patriarchs before Moses knew God Almighty or knew Jehovah as God Almighty or El Shaddai. Again, the words, the name of, in verse 3, are not present in the Hebrew text. El Shaddai was not the name of that God being. Jehovah was the name of that God. The Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek by 70 Jewish scholars in the late to mid 3rd century BC and a document which we now commonly refer to as the Septuagint which is just the Greek Old Testament. Septuagint is Latin for 70 in reference to these 70 Jewish scholars. The Septuagint translates Eye Asher Eye as Ego Aimi Ho'on which means I am the one existing, or the one that's being, or I am the being. In the second part of verse 14, I am has sent you is translated as ho'on has sent you, or the one being has sent you. It was not translated as ego aimi, or I am. The Jewish scholars did not translate the I am as I am. The Jewish scholars knew that the meaning of Eye would not be properly conveyed by simply using Ego Aimi or I am. This translation of Eye Asher Eye and Eye and, and verse 14 in the Septuagint will become important later in the sermon. Well, we've studied a little bit about Hebrew and Exodus 3.14. Let's turn now to Greek. In order to explore the meaning of John 8.58, we need to learn just a little bit about Greek language and its grammar. Here are two important points in Greek grammar that will help us in that understanding. Point number one, Greek has only one tense for the present tense. Greek has only one tense for the present tense. Like Hebrew, 
Greek is a very different language than English, having its own alphabet, its own lettering system, and being much more grammatically complex than the English language. Some of these complexities are discussed in the study paper on John 1 verse 1, which was recently posted on our website. And like Hebrew, the treatment of verbs is very different in Greek than it is in English. In English, we have five variations of the present tense. Remember, English is a very tense-centric language. We have five variations of the present tense, each with its own subtle differences in meaning and connotations. The first one, first of the five, is the simple present tense. If we say, I serve the man, we are using the simple present tense, which implies a repeated, uncompleted action in the present. An example would be, I serve the man each day. The second of the five tenses in the present tense is the present progressive tense. If we say, I am serving the man, we are using the present per progressive tense, which implies an ongoing, uncompleted action in the present. Actually, the present progressive tense is our most used present tense in English. This is the most commonly used form of the present tense. We say, I am going to the market. I am studying for the test. I am cooking dinner. So the example of, in this case would be, I am serving the man today. The third tense in the present tense in, in English is the present perfect tense. If we say, I have served the man, we are using the present perfect tense, which implies a past action continuing to the present. An example of that would be, I have served the man each time he came. The fourth option would be the present perfect progressive tense. If we say, I have been serving the man, we are using the present perfect progressive tense which implies a past action continuing up to the present and into the future. An example would be, I have been serving the man for 20 years. You've served him for 20 years, you're serving him now, and you will be continuing to serve him in the future. The fifth option would be the emphatic present tense. If we say, I do serve the man, we're using the emphatic present tense, which implies an emphasized present action. I do serve the man when I can. Now, we automatically in English use these tenses without even thinking about it because each comes with its own nuance in meaning in English. Whereas English has these five variations of the present tense, Greek only has one variation in the present tense, the simple present tense. It doesn't have these other, it doesn't have these five, it just has the one simple present tense. In each of these five examples of the English present tense, the, pre, the simple present tense in Greek would be used. The context of the sentence, and this is what's important, the context of the sentence would tell the listener or the reader the meaning of the tense. Point number two, Greek verbs are very progressive in nature. Again, Greek verbs in the present tense tend to be very progressive in nature. In that sense, the present tense in Greek is similar to the imperfective aspect in Hebrew, in that both are progressive and are ongoing and not completed. Please turn with me to Luke 15. Luke chapter 15, and we'll, be, we'll read part of the story of the prodigal son. Luke 15 and verse 29. 
One of the uses of the present tense in Greek is the present of past action still in progress, which is what we use to do that. We usually use the present perfect tense. This is a very important aspect of Greek. The present tense may be used to describe an action that begun in the past continues in the present. The emphasis is on the present time. And we can read this in Luke 15 and verse 29. I'm re first going to read this in the King James Version. Luke 15 and verse 29. But he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years have I done you service, neither broke I at any time your commandment, and yet you never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. Notice it says, Have I done? And verse 29. In the New Living Translation, the same verse says, But he replied, All these years, I've slayed for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. In Luke 15 and verse 29, the verb to serve or to do service in the Greek appears in the present tense because it reflects an action starting in the past and continuing to the present. So, here, the, this verse was translated into English in the King James Version and in the New Living Translation using the present perfect tense, not the simple present tense. It wouldn't make any sense in English to do that. But in, in Greek, it's in the simple present tense. Now, in the New King James Version, same verse, Luke 15, verse 29, we read, So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. Again, the verb in the present tense in Greek was translated into English in the New King James Version using the present perfect progressive tense, denoting an action in the past that is continuing into the present, and into the future, because the son was planning on serving his father in the future also. The son had served his father in the past, he's serving him now, and he would serve him in the future. Brethren, please turn with me to John 8. Now, to explain this, what comes naturally in, in English becomes kind of difficult to explain when you're having to ex explain all these rules when we automatically use the right tense when we speak English. In John 8, we'll read a famous story of Jesus' interaction with the Jewish leadership concerning his Messiahship. In John 8 and verse 51, John chapter 8, and we'll begin in verse 51. We read, Verily, verily, I say unto you, If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto Jesus, Now we know that you have a de devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and you say, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who make yourself to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him, and if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and I keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, You're not even fifty years old, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, here's the famous verse, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him, and, and Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now, brethren, the words in Greek for I am in verse 58 are ego aimi, which is E-G-O-E-I-M-I, ego aimi. 
which is the first person singular conjugation of the verb to be in the present tense. Just the simple present tense in Greek. The Greek words are translated into English also into the simple present tense. However, the context of the passage is in past events and past relationships. Jesus is referring to Abraham who lived over 1,600 years before the time that Jesus spoke these words to the Jews. Whereas the simple present tense in Greek can be used to show this relationship, this present connection to past actions or past events, the simple present tense in English cannot adequately denote this connection to the past. We would automatically in English use a different tense. This is why the phrase, before Abraham was, I am, is so stilted in English. No one would say that in English. In fact, it's so stilted that people have attempted to apply a special meaning to the phrase because the, pres the simple present tense makes no sense here in English. To accomplish the bridge between the past and the present, English does not use the simple present tense like Greek does. In English, we use one of two tenses to accomplish bringing the past and the present together. These two tenses, as we've studied before, are the present perfect tense and the present perfect progressive tense. The two tenses that were used to translate Luke 15 and verse 29. So the present perfect tense for I am is I have been. The present perfect progressive tense for I am would be I have been being, which again is, is very stilted. We would never say that, and no English speaker would express that idea in that manner. Therefore, English speakers would naturally choose the present perfect tense of the verb to be to describe a condition that was in the past that continues into the present. Consequently, a better rendering of John 8.58 using this present perfect tense would be, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I have been. This verse proclaimed three very important facts. Facts that the Pharisees thought were completely heretical and blasphemous when we use the present perfect tense. First fact is that Jesus existed at the time of Abraham, which automatically meant that he was with Jehovah at the time of Abraham and that he knew Abraham. Second fact, Jesus was indeed the son of Jehovah who had always existed previously. And three, Jesus still was at that present time and by extension would be that same divine being in the future. That simple proclamation was the reason why the Pharisees picked up stones to stone Jesus in verse 59. In their unconverted and twisted minds, what Jesus had just said was blasphemy. The Pharisees were not reacting to the use of the word I am as if Jesus were using a specific and special title. So brethren, as we have explored, there is no tie-in. There's no direct link between Exodus 3.14 and John 8.58, except if we stay entirely in English. Over the centuries, however, translators have repeatedly tried to link the two verses together. The King James Version, which was, which was translated in 1611, as well as many others include the words I am in capital letters in both verses. The capitalization of these words was the decision of the English translators, not the original writers. There are no capital letters in Hebrew. And in Greek, there are no small letters at the time of the oldest manuscripts. Biblical Greek was written entirely in capital letters. The small letters in Greek did actually did not appear until centuries later. 
Yet the question remains, who is the I am? To begin with, it is, an, it is important that we return back to Exodus 3. Exodus 3, and we'll read verses 14 through 16 once again. Exodus 3 and verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, You shall say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, Jehovah God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. That is huge. Jehovah is his name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them. So the name of the being who is the I Am is Jehovah. Jehovah is his name forever. We also read in verse 15 that Jehovah is God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Please turn with me to Acts 3 and verse 13, where we will read of this descriptor once again. This verse is a portion of the message that Peter gave to the multitudes of Jerusalem from Solomon's portico at the temple. In Acts 3 and verse 13, Acts chapter 3 and verse 13, we read, The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. This verse clearly shows that the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, was not Jesus. It had to be God the Father because He glorified His Son, Jesus. In Acts 5 and verse 29, Then Peter said, the other, and the other apostles answered and said, Here we are in Acts 5 and verse 29, We ought to obey God rather than men. And verse 30, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Again, this verse clearly shows that God the, fa uh, the, the God of our fathers was indeed God the Father because he raised up Jesus. It could not be Jesus. Referring back to Exodus 3.15, these two verses show that God the Father was indeed Jehovah. Please turn with me to Revelation 1. Referring back to Exodus 3.14, as discussed earlier with the imperfect aspect, or the imperfect and perfective aspect of Hebrew, the Aye Asher Aye could be translated as, I have been who I will be. In Revelation 1, we read a description of a being who is represented by this same description, which transcends time except this time, the description is in Greek. In Revelation 1, and we'll re read beginning in verse 4 from the New King James Version. Revelation 1 and verse 4. John to the seven churches who are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, brother, these verses include the salutation of grace and peace coming from three sources. One, the being who is and who was and who is to come. Two, the seven spirits who are before his throne. And three, Jesus Christ. So the being who is and who was and who is to come cannot be Jesus Christ because 
Jesus was one of the other three entities listed here. Therefore, the being who is and who was and who is to come is God the Father. It has to be God the Father. There's no other entity besides God the Father and Jesus and the seven spirits. The Greek term who is and who was and who is to come transcends time, including the past, the present, and the future, just as the phrase aye asher aye does in Hebrew. Please turn with me to Revelation 21. When the 70 Jewish scholars prepared and translated the Hebrew text into Greek, in what we know as the Septuagint, they did not transliterate the name Yehovah into Greek. They transliterated every other name, but the Tetragrammaton they did not trans transliterate. They instead translated the word Yehovah as the title Kurios in Greek, or which means Lord. But when they did it, they did it as a title. They did not include the word the in front of it. So it's just Lord. All verses in the New Testament which are quoting verses in the Old Testament containing Jehovah and the Septuagint were translated they translated the Tetragrammaton as Kurios without the article the. So there's a direct tie-in between the Greek of the Septuagint and the Greek in the New Testament. In Revelation 21 verse 22, something very, very remarkable here. The Bible is so consistent. In Revelation 21 and verse 22, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Now it's important to note that the Lord God Almighty is not the Lamb. The Lamb is Jesus Christ. Therefore, the Lord God Almighty cannot be Jesus Christ. That means that the Lord God Almighty is indeed God the Father. Now the words in Greek for Lord God Almighty are kurios, hotheos, hopantokrator. And this verse, again, kurios, is, appears here without the article the. Now, these words in Hebrew could be translated as Yehovah El Shaddai. Kurios without the, the V in front would be Yehovah. Hotheos, which means God, which would be El. And Almighty Pantocrator would be Shaddai. So here you have Yehovah El Shaddai. All names and titles referring to God the Father. These are the names and titles given to Jehovah, given by Jehovah to Moses in Exodus 6 and verse 3, which we read pre previously today. Another important concept is to place ourselves in Judea. This is something I think that people just don't do. We need to place ourselves in Judea as a Jew at the time of Christ. Every Jew in good standing every Jew in good standing in Judea at that time believed that Jehovah was their God. The God they prayed to was Jehovah. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy 6 and we'll read verse 4. In Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, which is called the Shema, and it's probably one of the most, if not the most revered and sacred text in Judaism, we read, in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, Hear, O Israel, Shema in Hebrew means hear. Hear, O Israel, Yehovah our Elohim, Yehovah is one. Yehovah our God, Yehovah is one. Again, all the Jews in the time of Christ in Judea believed that Yehovah was their God. That was the God they prayed to. That was the God that they worshipped. During his ministry, Jesus never once declared or preached that he was their God. He never once preached that he was Jehovah. 
Jesus declared and preached that he was the Son of God. And to a Jew, that meant that he was saying he was the Son of Jehovah. During his ministry, Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man and as the Son of God, or the Son of Jehovah. He never referred to himself once as God. Please turn with me to to John verse uh, chapter eleven. John chapter eleven, where we, we will read the beginning of the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. And John chapter one, eleven will begin in verse one. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. So a clear distinction here. For the glory of God, or of Jehovah, but that the Son of Jehovah might be glorified thereby. In verse 3, Jesus said that Lazarus' sickness was for the glory of God. Again, he then referred to himself as the Son of Jehovah, and not as Jehovah, not as God which was the God that the Jews worshipped. Later in the chapter, Jesus asks Martha what she believed. And in John 11, in verse 27, she replies, John 11, verse 27, She says unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. Christos, in Greek, which means Messiah, or the Anointed One. She said, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Jehovah, which should come into the world. Martha never claimed that Jesus was the God that she was worshiping. She never claimed that that Jesus was Jehovah. Instead, she believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Anointed One, who Yahweh had sent. And that Yahweh was the God that she worshipped. And Jesus was his son. Please turn with me to John 6. Jesus had just finished preaching to the multitude of believers and disciples who had become offended at what Jesus had preached. And many of those disciples left and never followed again. And John 6 and verse 66 John chapter 6, and we'll begin in verse 66. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you are that Christ, you are that anointed one, the Son of the living God. Again, Christ or Christos in Greek simply means Messiah or the one sent. In verse 69, Peter confidently declares that he and and the disciples believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the one sent by Jehovah and that he was the son of the living God. Which means that Peter did not believe that Jesus was that living God. To Peter, as a Jew, that living God was Jehovah. So the disciples declare that Jesus was the son of Jehovah, or the son of God the Father. Please turn with me to John 10. Jesus was confronting the Jewish leadership, and so many times it got pretty testy because the Jewish leadership hated his message. 
he hate, they hated what he stood for. In John 10 and verse 34, John chapter 10 and verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If ye called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say you of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, you blaspheme, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. Again and again and again, Jesus refers to the God that the Jews worshipped as his Father. He never claimed to be that being. He claimed to be that being's Son. The, the God that the Jews worshipped, again, was Jehovah. So Jehovah was his Father. He proclaimed time and time and time again that he was the son of his father, Jehovah. Please turn with me to John 4, where Jesus points the worship not to himself. He never directed worship to himself while he was here on the earth. But he always directed it to the father. In John 4, in verse 23, we read something, a prophecy about something in the future about future worship. John 4 and verse 23, But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. Again, Jesus never claimed to be the God that the Jews were worshiping. And they were worshiping Jehovah. Jesus never instructed his disciples or the Jews to worship him. He always instructed them to worship the Father. Please turn with me to John 8, where we will read the heated conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees about who Jesus exactly was. In John 8 and verse 31, we'll begin... Here, John 8, and we'll begin in verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you believe in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and, we, and were never in bondage to any man. How do you say you shall make us free? We, you shall be made free. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. So to a Jew, those Jews saying that, they're saying we have one Father, even Jehovah. Here in verse 41, the Jews acknowledge that Jehovah, the God that they worship, was their Father. And the being that they worship was God the Father. Kind of makes sense. In John 8, 53, a little bit later in the chapter, John 8 and, chap and verse 53, the Jews said, Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who, make you, who do you make yourself to be? And verse 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father 
that honors me, of whom you say, he is your God. So here in verse 54, Jesus acknowledged that the Jews considered God the Father to be their God. Their God was Jehovah. So this is another proof that God the Father was Jehovah. And Christ acknowledged that fact. The Jews acknowledged that fact. Brethren, Jesus spent three and a half years of his ministry announcing the kingdom of God. And announcing that he was the Messiah, the anointed one. And that he was sent by God the Father. All of the Jews acknowledged God the Father as their God. And they acknowledged God the Father as Jehovah. Again, Jesus never claimed to be Jehovah. But he did claim to be the Messiah, the one sent by Jehovah. Please turn back with me to John 11. Well, we, we will read a short prayer that Jesus prayed right before the resurrection of Lazarus. What did Jesus pray that the people would understand? John 11 and verse 41. John chapter 11 and verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I knew that you hear me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that you have sent me. That was Christ's prayer, that people would believe that he had been sent by his father, Jehovah. Please turn with me to John 14. And we'll read a passage that we read every single Passover. Jesus even instructed his disciples that they believe in him. Again, as Jews in Judea, the disciples already believed in Jehovah who was God the Father. They knew who Jehovah was. They've been, that's the God that they had been worshiping for centuries. John 14 and verse 1. A verse we all know by heart. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many offices. If it were not so... I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 14 of the book of John, verse 1 contains a statement of fact, and then it contains a command. The statement of fact was that the disciples believed in God. They believed in Jehovah. They believed in God the Father. The command was that they also believe in Jesus that he was the son of Jehovah, that he was the Messiah, he was the one sent, he was the anointed one. He was the one who came fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies. Again, you believe in God, statement of fact, believe you also in me, a command. In verse 2, Jesus also refers to the temple as his father's house. Not his house. It was, the temple was his father's house. The temple was the house of Jehovah. Conversely, the Jewish leadership and the community acknowledged Jehovah to be their father. But they never acknowledged that Jesus was Jehovah's son. And that he was the Messiah. He was the one who was the anointed one. Who had been sent by Jehovah had been sent by his father. Brethren, the Bible is full of passages in the New Testament referring to God the Father that are direct quotes from passages in the Old Testament referring to Jehovah. These passages never refer to Jesus as being Jehovah. Brethren, much has been written, much has been published. Much has been announced, much has been discussed concerning that Jesus Christ was and is the I Am. This claim and belief is made by staying completely in English and making the discussion and the resulting proofs an English-English determination. 
It's just not correct. Rather than in conclusion, the Bible shows that the I Am in Exodus 3.14 was indeed Jehovah. The Bible also shows that God the Father was indeed Jehovah. Jesus never claimed to be Jehovah, but he did always claim to be Jehovah's Son. Jesus never claimed to be the I Am. Brethren, we can confidently state that John 8, verse 58, was an announcement by Jesus Christ that he existed back at the time of Abraham and that he still exists. He was not announcing that he was the I Am of Exodus 3.14. But brethren, who is the I Am? From the many points and proofs explored this afternoon, we can confidently state that the I Am is indeed God the Father and not Jesus Christ. May God the Father and Jesus Christ bless us as we strive and desire to understand more and more about both of them. As we strive and desire to obey them more and more and more each day. And as we strive and desire to show their love for us in the way that we treat one another.